Welcome to Beyond Human, The Last Call. This is our second session. I'm going to assume that you've watched our first session. And <clears throat> we, after that session, we got our heads together, watched the session, and tried to look at it from your point of view and determine where the big gaps were. And we've pretty much designed today's session about or around those gaps. The questions that might have come into your head then are since watching yesterday's session. And so I'm going to look primarily at June and Sawyer to help me with those questions. They've listed them, and we're just going to cover them one right after the other. June, are you going to help me with this list of questions better than you did yesterday? Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to try. <laughs> How about you, Sawyer? Well, I'll do my best. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's get started. Um, June, what was the first question on our list? Um, well, the first one that we have written down here is, as far as overcoming, how was Jesus' <coughs> mission different from T&O's? Well, uh, I know I could say this again and again, but that's a good question. <laughs> well, Jesus' mission, you know, I get uncomfortable comparing Jesus' mission to T&O's mission because I know how precious Jesus' mission is in our eyes as well as in much of the public's eyes. And <clears throat> I know how offensive it could be to compare Jesus' mission with T and O, whom most people have never heard of. But we have to address the question. And what's most significant in the difference of the missions is even though Jesus and T and Do both came with the information of the end of the ages approaching, and if you're going to get from the human kingdom into our Heavenly Father's kingdom, then you're going to have to overcome the world. You're going to have to leave everything and come and follow me, and as a rep, I can be used as an instrument of that kingdom to help you get into that kingdom after you leave your humanness behind. That much is common. One major feature that's very different. Jesus' mission was designed before he came that he would represent, it certainly, certainly on the record, would represent the purity that was required to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, this is the reason why humans say again and again, well, I can never be like him because he's so pure. He never sinned. He was spotless. He went through his whole life without sin. Well, that was the design. Now, not that I'm saying that he should have been sinful, for he had overcome the world. Prior to that incarnation, he had overcome the world. So he did not need to get back into the world, even though he did need to awaken, to recognize that he had come from the kingdom of heaven and what his mission was, and that awakening was still difficult and painful, and I'm sure trying for him because he knew how blasphemous it was going to sound the minute he began, began to express it. Now, in T. and Doe's case, it's almost 180 degrees in another direction. T and O came, and first of all, our, our awakening was much later as far as in the lifetime uh, than Jesus, because T and O met in their early 40s and were as asleep as you can be uh, at that time. And But even more major difference was that both of us were very much into humanness. Um, <clears throat> this was a design. Uh, it was designed this way in the kingdom of heaven. 
before we came in because Satan had grasped onto what Jesus' MO had been. And he, the way he could keep humans from thinking about their overcoming was to picture Jesus as someone that was so perfect that, that since he died on the cross, he, did, he can, by doing that, redeem you if you just love him and believe that he existed and accept him as your savior. That's the way he could keep you from relating to the fact that you would have to do what Jesus said and overcome the world also as he did. Since Lucifer or Satan had done a such a, had done such a good job of having people relate to that perfection MO or that purity MO of Jesus' mission, the next level then said, or the kingdom of heaven then said, well, we're going to do this representation of sending, or this time of sending representatives. We're going to do just the opposite. We're going to send them and let them get completely into the world to remind humans that you can be completely into the world and get out of the world. I told you yesterday that when I met T, and even before I met T, oh, I would say probably a, a year before I met T, that my life began to just fall apart. But <clears throat> the important thing is that it's common, even though we've discussed a little bit about how uh, we discussed some yesterday, that how a symptom of a soul awakening to the point of where it jives with its previous incarnation, a symptom that accompanies that awakening seems to be a life kind of falling apart. But the uh, some souls, if they haven't overcome much uh, in their time in human lessons, then their awakening certainly would not be anything traumatic. If they did not overcome uh, their attachments, then nothing traumatic is happening because they're not dropping those attachments at the point of their awakening where they would jive with a previous incarnation. I know I'm going way beyond the question that you brought up about mm. the hole in yesterday's thought. I could go on with this one, you know, the rest of this hour. Let's go to our next question. Sawyer, what's next on our list? Well, how did T's uh, mission differ from Doe's uh, mission since T left and returned to the kingdom of heaven before Doe? Well, that's, <laughs> here I go again, that's an um, interesting question too. That was a very tough one for me. And I think it was a tough one for T because it came as such a surprise. Um, I don't know why, but T and I thought that uh, we just knew, it seemed, that we would both be here for the full duration of the task, and it didn't occur to us that one might leave prior to the other one leaving. And when, uh, well, let's see, T has been gone almost seven years. It'll be seven years this spring or this summer, uh, when T began to see the signs of leaving her vehicle, she, I think, was puzzled, and I certainly was puzzled. But I must take this opportunity to relate to you that it didn't change her position at all, her devotion to her Heavenly Father and to this task. She didn't want to relate to the human connection at all or to the flesh body's connection to the world. She maintained perfectly steadfast to the mission that she was involved in and in her partnership with me in that mission and remained true to it to every second. She didn't say, what has, what's the next level doing here? What are they? Uh, what's happening here? Her only thought was, 
to me, I'm glad that you don't have to experience what I am going through. And the irony there was, I was saying, I wish I could be going in your place, and that was, that was no big, uh, wonderful thing for me to say. It was because I feared being left with the responsibility of the mission with my partner being gone. And I did. I seriously feared it. And I have to stop here in this and address another question. Because you could say, well, how did T, what caused T to leave her vehicle? What, what was used as the instrument of her leaving when she did? And it was, the vehicle broke down. And uh, humans would say, well, the vehicle died. And so how can you say she left her vehicle? Well, even though I know that T, because I know and understand T, and I understand T's relationship with our Heavenly Father, I know that she had within her power, if she or within her authority, if she chose to use it, she, she could have made the choice of when she left her vehicle or when she didn't. You can say, oh, well, that's baloney, and that's fine if you want to say it. But I know T. You don't know T. These students, they know T. We know T, too. <laughs> but I know that T's thinking was to her father, I didn't expect this, that I would be leaving my vehicle at this time, but if that's what you have in mind for me, and if that's what you have in mind for Doe, and for the class, then that's, that's what we want. Now, I could see in T's eyes, I could read her soul, I could see mixed feelings, I could see part of her that was joyful she would be in knowing that out of the human kingdom, that portion of her mind that was here could be back in a vehicle that was appropriate for the kingdom of heaven and back in a closer, realistic, physical relationship with her heavenly father. And that couldn't help but be joyful. But she didn't want to think about that because she didn't want to shirk her responsibility. She was still task conscious. She was still concerned with what is this going to, what kind of hardship is this going to play for Doe? Uh, is this, what kind of pressure is this going to put? on him and on the classroom. Are students going to be lost because I'm leaving my vehicle? Or are they going to slip into thinking, well, T's died and here's Doe, so this makes all this fall apart. And yet I know that she knew that if the students knew any of the truth that had been given to us and that we shared an understanding of, that they would not look at it from that point of view. If they were challenged by that, then it was good that they'd be challenged in that way. If that was the point of their falling away, then there needed to be a point of their falling away. They were going to be challenged sooner or later with some test, because that's the name of growth, is our being confronted with tests that cause us to either go forward closer to our Heavenly Father, closer to the kingdom of heaven, or we're challenged with saying, oh, I don't know. This, this is maybe, I'm coming to my senses. I'll go and recover my humanness if I can. Back to your question. When T left her vehicle and returned, what it meant to me, even though it still breaks my heart, to recall the experience It very swiftly and very solidly put me on firmer ground in relationship to my Heavenly Father. It put me in a better relationship with T than I had before she left her vehicle. I know that T is still to this day 
my primary, if not my total, link with our Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father that we shared in that task, I believe that we still share to this day the same Heavenly Father. But also in my awareness that T is an older soul, a more experienced soul, has been given more knowledge, knows more, can make choices more quickly and more readily in the judgment that she has learned from our Father. <clears throat> it has done tremendous things for me to find myself, wow, alone as far as physically alone. My partner has left her physical body. It, I even, it feels so funny for me to say her when I speak of T, even though she was in a body that had been a female. And I say had been because she had certainly overcome any gender consciousness before um, uh, going back to our Father's kingdom. Well, I could talk, I could go on and on, but it meant a tremendous growth opportunity for me and for the class. It tested me, it tested the class, and we're all ten feet taller because of it. It put me in a relationship now with T, similar to the relationship that T had with our Heavenly Father before T left her vehicle. If we ever came down to question in our working as a partnership as to who might have the last word. It was never fought after or debated, but it came evident after a period of time. In my searching, not because he imposed it, but in my searching I recognized that T knew more. Therefore, she had a better trusting relationship with her Heavenly Father. She could recognize His voice more readily than I, rather than, well, does, uh, does that mean this, or do we need to try that, or she didn't need to do all the seeking and searching because the voice was clearer, the control of the frequency, if you want to put it that in that illustration, was clear. And had she not left her vehicle and put me in the position that I am now in, I wouldn't have this opportunity at this time to really work and work hard on my connection with that mind. When we, when uh, the class and my relationship with the class, when we're confronted with questions and decisions that needed, need to be made, I could easily say, oh well, what am I going to do in this situation? What am I going to do? Or we'll do this, we'll do that. And the test always is, do I say, T, what would you have us do? Your will, not mine, not ours. And if the class and if I can always connect with our Father's kingdom through the link that we have, the closest older member that we have, and that link is the assurance. Now I know that even if T got called on another task for a period of time while I'm in this position, that I know that T's Heavenly Father, which also, as I said, is my Heavenly Father, even though T's older, I know that my best funneling of my asking, my safest funneling, the thing that could get me in completely off the track is if I said, oh, Father, so-and-so, instead of going through tea. I have learned from my experience that I ask, I continue to ask my partner. I say, T, what do we do in this situation? I don't always get an answer right away. Sometimes I get no answer at all. It means the question isn't worth answering. And or I might keep looking for well, what, what was wrong with that question. But I know my assurance of staying on track. So to finish what I started to say is, even if T were put on another task, I know that our Father would station someone saying, now if Doe says, T, what do we do? That's when you answer. Only then. <laughs> but if he says, well, Father, what do we do? Don't answer. Because he's going to get off track. Now, boy, 
that opens a whole nother big question. Why do I, would I dress something to tea instead of to my Heavenly Father? <clears throat> tea is my older member. Tea is in the succession of relationship. In a sense, tea is my Heavenly Father. Even though I still relate to the older member that dealt with tea and dough as a partnership. But it's, it's not that I'm elevating some human named T. That's just an identification that went to that older member that is my safeguard for staying on the right track. I know how Lucy can dive in and answer my call when I direct it to my Heavenly Father. And I can feel that it's off track. Lucy, can, Lucy is not permitted to answer the call that I direct to T. That's protected for my sake and for the sake of our students. I know that's hard to understand when you know how right it is for you to relate to your Heavenly Father. Now, this I have to jump to another question that I know is on their list now because this forces me into this question of what is meant when people say you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The only ones who really had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ are the ones who were physically present with him and looked to him and believed him. Now, I have to enlarge that picture and say that also means that those souls that after they left those vehicles in the time that they were with Jesus, that they continue to have, as long as they have not turned from him, they continue to have a personal relationship with that same soul unless the kingdom of heaven or our Father has put someone else in that position. And I'm not certainly suggesting that anything has happened in that regard in our presence here or our assignment here. But I have to make the point. When Jesus said, if you do this in my name, he was talking about those who knew him and believed him. And they were disciples. They were devoted. They were going to the kingdom of heaven via the ductwork of the one called Jesus. He was their rep. They accepted him as their rep. And they were calling his name. In that same way, I have to, at this time, call T's name. That, that, now, I don't know. T could have been a return of that soul that was Jesus. It doesn't matter to me. You could say, oh, but it should matter. Then you don't know the knowledge. You don't know Jesus. You don't know my Heavenly Father. Or you would know the knowledge that is given to me, not because of anything that I deserve, but by their choice, they give me the knowledge as they gave the knowledge to T and O, as they give now to T and as T gives it to me, and it is the same knowledge that was in Jesus. It is from the same family, from the same household, it comes down the same trunk and goes out the same vines. If you really knew him or know him today, you will know that we're of that same family, that our information does not differ one iota, that it is the same truth, just different vehicles, different reps. Now, the Position is a little different because, and here's another question on your list, I know, <laughs> because we're at the end of the age. And Jesus kept warning about what the importance of the end of the age. I mean, this is a big time here at the end of the age. What's the end of the age? Well, you know, the hippies and the New Agers speak of the end of the age as when 
Aquarius is around the corner, or here we are at the year 2000, this is the end of the age. And it is the end of the age. Now, the important thing is that, well, this brings in another question that I have to talk about and then return to that one for a moment. Well, first we'll talk about the end of the age a little bit more. <coughs> the end of the age is likened to when the kingdom of heaven, and I must say here in the same breath, not only the kingdom of heaven, but it's when the garden is harvested at the end of an age. Now, how is a garden harvested? A garden is harvested by the ones who have a relationship to the garden, be it from our Father's house or be it from those that are off the strain, off the vine of misinformation and connected with the one that we refer to as Lucifer or Satan, though they certainly don't know that. They're con from their point of view, they're connected with the Son of Light, uh, the Angel of Light, the truth. They, they believe that truth. It has some different earmarks, as we discussed. It has some earmarks of your gods, your, you know, the, the cosmic consciousness, the universal mind. Those earmarks are not found in our Father's house. Our Father's house are earmarks of Creator, Father, Son, the way the pipeline works down in relationship from the kingdom of heaven to the human kingdom. Well, back to here we are at the end of the age, and it's harvest time. Harvest time means that it's time for the garden to be spaded up. It's time for recycling of souls. It's time for some to graduate. It's time for some to be put on ice. It's time. Now, I don't know all of the things that are going to happen at the end of the age because that harvesting task is not one that I am participating in. I, I suppose that I would say that T's job and O's job, or our partnership task, is, is tooting that trumpet or making this sound right here at the end that says, last call. This is, if you want to go beyond human, if you want to not have this age that we've been in here for 6,000 years go down the drain, if you're connected, if, you've re if you have received a gift that connects you with this truth, with our Heavenly Father, with the family of the Creator, then you have an opportunity to do it, to overcome the world, to move into that king kingdom permanently, not needing to return to the human condition. Now, I'm afraid I have to go to another one of your questions, and this one is, is well, where does this saved thing get in there, this idea of being saved? And Jesus, he, when he said, if you believe who I am, and you believe what I'm saying, and if you stay connected with me, if you do things through my name, then you'll be saved. Now, and that's true. That doesn't mean that you have finished your overcoming. It means that you're not wasted. Being saved means you're not wasted. It also means that you're saved from not going with the crowd that's going with misinformation, that's going with all that is not true. So to be saved, even at the end of the age, now I, I, don't, I do not know, and I'm glad I don't know, but if I should know, then I guess then I will know, because I only know what has been given to me. And it's given to me on their timetable, not when I want to know it. And all I know is what is given to me to know. And even when I receive what I think that they have given to me, and I think I know it as soon as they give me something else, I recognize that what I know was partially out of balance or out of sync. And the next thing they give me makes me re-examine it and update it. And, and suddenly I see what I thought I knew before is not that accurate, that the new perception is much more accurate. And so I think I know that until I receive something else and then I realize that that's the process of growth. But here we are at the end of the age. Now, 
to be saved, in a sense, when Jesus said you can be saved, it was not the end of the age, though. He knew, he knew it was approaching, and he knew from his point of view it could be right around the corner. And he told him the signs of what the end of the age would be, and according to all the people you listen to and all the prophecy and that's going around, and everybody says, this is it, this is the end of the age. Now, we don't know exactly the hour or the minute. Well, unfortunately, the exact hour or the minute doesn't really matter that much. It is the end of the age. What matters is where are you at the time of the spading, at the time of the harvest. What happens to you? Have you become something that's so worthless that our Father's house has no need of you and he just recycles you as a part of his recycling environmental control for a possible new age? If, now I don't mean new age, new age, I mean his new age. If he wants to use this garden as a hothouse again, then he can take the waste, including soul waste, including vehicle waste, and he can recycle it into a useful product for a garden to be planted again. So one is a question of, have I become something that's just going to be recycled as waste at the end of the age? Or might I become something that can actually complete my overcoming under the helpful guidance hand of reps that whose task is Overcoming. I can help you overcome this world. I'll give you lessons. I'll, I'll use it as the object of, of lessons and put you to test that I don't mean to put you to test for. I, I don't even like put you to test, but I'm willing to put you to test. Ever since T and I have been working with the class, we, we put themselves and ourselves to test constantly. Or let me say it this way, the kingdom of heaven puts us to these tests as we ask for their will, not ours. We don't ever design tests for students are for ourselves. They are designed for us and given to us. They always shock us. They're always a surprise, even to this day. Even though we've learned, uh-oh, that's a test. <laughs> we've gotten that far recognizing here comes a test. Okay, so one is I can become waste at the end of the age. One is I can overcome the world with the help of those who have overcome the world. I expressed to you in the last session that even these students have. I've gotten instruction that these students have reached a point in their overcoming that they can survive as beginners in the kingdom of heaven and not need to return to the human condition. In other words, that point of their overcoming is sufficient that they can move into the kingdom of heaven. Take a physical vehicle that belongs to the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's a big picture, isn't it? Because that physical vehicle in our Father's house doesn't need to be reproductive. It's neither male nor female. It's got no gender. It has no race relationship. It has no allegiance to anything of a plant. It has allegiance only to trunk and vines and representatives right down the chain of command or the, the stepwise relationship or link. Now, what if I didn't, I'm not waste, but I haven't finished my overcoming, but I believe that what you're saying is the truth. And I believe that I'm hearing the kingdom of heaven through you. That it isn't you. It is our Heavenly Father. It is the kingdom of heaven speaking through you. Can I, if I really believe it, can I be saved? That's your best chance of being saved. But I'm afraid, in my, from my point of view, since I see that instruction still has with it, that if you hear this information, there is just barely time for you to overcome. So if there's time for me to overcome, then why am I asking the question, can I be saved? Now let's go back to 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, well, if you believe on me and you do to the best of your ability what I say to do. And he might as well have even said, you may not have overcome the world sufficiently to not need to return, but you can be saved because you're in the process of overcoming. And it was the same thing as saying, 
If you believe in me and you are a disciple and you've connected with the kingdom of heaven through me, then you will be taken to my father's house and you'll be put in the fridge or you'll be put on ice until a, an appropriate time to replant you so that you can get on with your overcoming and arrive at the point where you can then move up, not needing to return. Now, if we're receiving instruction that even these students can help you, that there's barely time for you to do overcoming of your own sufficient not to need to return, then why would we even want to think of, well, can I just be saved without overcoming? I'm afraid that if I, I would be fearful that the one who was in the position of judging whether I could be saved, would he be, would his decision be colored by my saying, well, I'm not sure that I can overcome fast enough. So, but will I be saved? Will I be saved? Or wouldn't I want to be more concerned with, goodness, if I can do my dead level best, give it everything I have, to be in the full thrust of overcoming, then I know that my Heavenly Father will not forsake me, will not lose me. If I recognize I want Him, I am a lost sheep, I'm someone who wants to get back into His house, back into the hands of the Creator that made me, if I give everything I have, and I say the same is true to you, if you do everything you can do to get as close as you can get, as fast as you can get, and not reject what the kingdom of heaven has given to you as the means for that help, then there's no way that our Father would discard you or do less than save you from the reaper, or from the <clears throat> whatever catastrophes might accompany the end of the age. Now, I'm afraid I've got to go on in this same context and say, at the end of the age, not only is our Father's house a part of the reaping process, but so is Lucifer's house. It is Lucifer, don't forget, that says, you don't have to do anything. Just believe on Jesus. And Lucy has put himself right there in that position where he is calling himself Jesus. I am Jesus. I will tell you through your prayers. I will give you that confidence. I will give you that feeling of I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's all I have to do. I hate to tell you, you're not connected with our Father's house, though you want to, though you want to be connected, though you want goodness, though you want God, though you want to be a part of our Creator's household. Our Father, our Creator, has rules and says, when I send you truth, when I send you updates, when I send you information on how you can come into my house, you can't just relate to the information that I gave 2,000 years ago and now let the one who dove into that because you were the ones that deserved to receive my household, Lucy dives into that and he grasps you and he gets you by misinformation. He even says, just call on Jesus, but call on him in the wrong ways. Don't call on him the way Jesus said, Jesus said, you've got to overcome the world. Come and follow me. Leave everything. You can't even be my disciple unless you give up your whole world. Leave your whole life behind and come and follow me. Now, that's not just because that's what Jesus said. That's what any representative from the kingdom of heaven would say when it's time for that someone has a possibility of moving from the human kingdom into our heavenly Father's kingdom and staying there and receiving the rewards of that kingdom. Now, I know this is hard to take. And I know if you are a devoted, a devout Christian, and you're hearing what I'm saying, that you're being, your head is being pounded on at this moment, and you're saying, this, how do I know this guy that's talking to me that says he's no? No, how do I know he's not Satan? 
You snubbed Lucifer. You don't. Something inside of you has to know. Something, now go search your scriptures. Go get back in your closet and say to your heavenly father, reach to the most high God, saying, I don't want to be, I don't want to settle for less. I don't want to just uh, adopt this misinformation if it's been misinformation. If I too must separate from the world, if I too, in order to get in your household, must drop everything as the disciples did 2,000 years ago, if I too must overcome the world, then please wake me up and let me see that and let me do it and lead me to it. I wish I could say to you that our Father's kingdom has lots of reps around with the information of how to overcome the world. T and I keep searching for them. We don't want to be the only reps that are here at this time. I hope that we're not. There may be others, but I haven't found them. I can't find them. Now, you could, now I know how uh, hidden we have been. Maybe they're hidden. Maybe they're with classrooms that will surface and they know the same truth. Do you think T and I wouldn't welcome it and applaud and say, Ray, 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 here's somebody else that's from the kingdom of heaven and knows the same formula and is offering the same formula. For one thing we do know is you have to overcome the world. You have to separate from the world. You can't take any of the ties with this world into that world without knowing that you're going to have to return and sever them eventually if you expect to gain membership in that kingdom and serve in that kingdom as a member of that kingdom. The human kingdom is not where your major service is. That's part of misinformation. The human kingdom is a lesson ground. It's for hard knocks. It's, it's designed that nothing work so that you would look for your heavenly father it's, it's, does, no matter what Lucy tries, it doesn't work. The only way he gets you is to have you accept all the misinformation is truth. He says if you live a good life, if you take care of your family, you set aside the money, you buy your insurance policies, you leave a nice trust fund, and you know, so that the kid's college is paid for, and, and when I go, then my wife is taken care of, and when she goes, the kids are taken care of, and, and we go to death with no fear because we know that we died in the Lord. I'm afraid it's wrong, Lord. I mean, the Christians are out there now even saying, the Lord wants you to have things. He wants you to have nice things. That's true, he does. He doesn't want you to pursue him. He doesn't want you to pursue him. He said, don't pursue anything. Pursue only me. Me. Nothing else. I'm sorry, you can't bring anything with you. You can't bring your wife with you. You can't bring kids with you. That doesn't mean your wife can't come. Doesn't mean your kids can come. But you can't bring them with you. You have to come alone, having severed everything in your relationship only with our Heavenly Father, saying, you're all I want. I want nothing else at that time when you're in that mindset and you're willing to drop everything and leave everything behind. He sees you through it. You, you can't actually do the severing. He pulls it away as you ask. He pulls it a step at a time as you ask. And a lot of times the things that you would like for him to pull away, he doesn't pull away that fast because he wants to develop strength within you. Um, effort to continue to work against that thing and not give in to it so that you get into his kingdom with some muscle and some ability to have some significant service as a member of his kingdom. Well, sounds like it must be Sunday or Saturday <laughs> depending on where your Sabbath day is and I've got into preaching. I couldn't help it. But where did we leave off here? Who's next? Is the question back to June? I think June is next. Come it's on. going to be hard to figure out exactly okay, where that's I was right. to dive in, but let's, let's see. Let's go to our next question. Um, 
Well, I wondered if you could define a little bit the difference between the vehicle and the soul, just for okay. a point of reference. That's a good, a good place to start. The vehicle and the soul. <clears throat> There's only one place that souls come from, our Father's kingdom. There's only one creator in all that exists, and that's the top man. That's the chief of chiefs, the god of gods. The, and I don't mean that they're, don't misunderstand that or find fault with it. Unless, I mean, if you want to find fault with it, that's your choice. You can find fault with anything I say if that's what's on your mind to find fault. There's only one creator, and that's our Father's kingdom. And he teaches creation. Now, he made souls. Lucy and his camp cannot make souls. What I left out that I started to tell you a few minutes ago is that here at the end of the age, Lucy even is getting members of army into his kingdom at the end of the age. Those who really he wants that have become good servants and have bought his misinformation. If our father's house wants to, he can let those move in to his kingdom. Now, what we don't know is when Lucy's judgment day is in actuality a day. He's already received a sentence. He knows he's going to lose his life, his very existence. And his higher cadre or his higher echelon of his officers, they're going to lose theirs too. But we don't know that our father hasn't designed it that after that happens that someone is going to fall in line to replace Lucifer or Satan and his higher officers and his whole officers candidate school, those that follow his misinformation as if it were the truth. But Lucy wants souls. He also wants vehicles. Now, he has to indoctrinate. There's one big, big, big difference between our father's kingdom and Lucy's kingdom. Our father's kingdom is not the aggressor. Our father's kingdom says, ask and you receive. Seek and you find. Be quiet to know that I am God. Now, Lucy says, hey, listen. He's an aggressor. He tells you what you're supposed to believe. He justifies his misinformation. He thinks that he's really great. He thinks that he's adding numbers to the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is certainly elsewhere more than, than the confines to planet earth. I mean, the main issue of what's going on here in conflict of good and evil is not just on planet earth. That's insignificant in comparison. The main issue of even numbers is in the heavens. Even at this time when ufologists and the whole community of people being so aware of space aliens and do they have a presence on this, on this uh, planet and are there bases where they do genetic experimentation and are they growing actual uh, creatures there? Do they abduct humans and do they do genetic experimentation? Do they also do artificial insemination with humans and then bring back the child and show it to the mother? I mean, all these events have so-called surfaced in the last few years. They're not the way of our Father's kingdom. They are the way of these misinformation people who do not believe that they are misinformation. They are not knowingly misinformation. They've bought into another idea, into other information. It's We've talked about this in the class a lot. It's like our father's corporation at one time was the only corporation. And at a given time, someone said, oh, I think I'm going to step out of our father's corporation. I've, I've learned a lot, but I think I can go further than 
I don't like the position I'm staying in. It seems restricted to me. It seems that I'm limited. Don't forget we discussed the other day that you can't lose the option to think poorly. You can't even lose the option of rejecting your connection. You can't lose the option of rejecting the truth. That option always stays with you, even in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, here's this corporation that belonged to our Father's kingdom, and it was the only corporation at a given time. And then this member says, I don't like this limiting, this restricting position that I'm in, because my older member, I, I, I don't think he's that smart. He, he holds me back. I could really be moving forward. And so he goes out here and forms another corporation, and he begins to do things, and his father says, wait a minute, you're not looking to me. You're going on your own. You're doing something altogether different. You're, and he, he recognizes that he's going different. He acknowledges that he's going different. And then at a given time, our father's kingdom, or the one that was connected to him, the one that was his father, said, I can't let you come back into our house. I can't let you come back into our world. Now, I'm talking about a physical place, a part of the heavens that only those can go. The physical part of our heavens that only those can go who are a member of our father's house, our father's corporation, in his kingdom, the one which belongs to the creator. And he says, I can't let you go on with your behavior and your thinking and your renegade attitude and your letting this ego come back in if you want to be somebody. I can't let you come back into this place. I'm going to confine you to outside of this camp. Now here it's so easy at this time to be deceived and think of these well, here's some of these space aliens. Well, it's rumored that these space aliens have even met with humans, have met with military of different nations, uh, uh, conduct experimentation of spacecrafts, and that even governments have agreed to let these aliens do certain things as long as, as they give us some of their technical knowledge. And now, how much of that's true? I don't know. I don't want to know. But whatever of it is true, I see all the earmarks of the renegade, the misinformation. But I'm just telling you, those who are misinformation, they do not know that they are misinformation. They have, but they usually have bought an easier out that required less of them, and they were assured of self-elevation. In our Father's kingdom, there's no assurance of self-elevation. If you want to be a servant, you give up self. You become nothing. You crave to be nothing so badly that you scream for even loss of identity. And our Father's kingdom says, wait a minute. Since I can't take away your option, your choices, then you're still going to have some identity. I may call you this and this task and call you that and that task, but you have to have some sort of identity that I'll give you, so I can't let you just give yourself to me and then forget about it, and you're, you're ended, because you're a servant. I permitted you to come back as an individual and be a servant. But if you want to be an individual, and you're not pleased with the rate of growth as I give it to you through my representatives, then you're going to go in opposition to me. You're going to stray from me. So. There are literally many, many, many members now that are on the misinformation corporation and are serving, thinking they're serving the truth, the universal mind, the cosmic consciousness, the we are gods. Now, they, even as you investigate space aliens or their vehicles, you'll see things that you wouldn't see in our Father's kingdom. Our Father's kingdom, they don't make babies. They get babies from the human kingdom. So there's no gender. They don't have ties. Therefore, there's no marrying. There's no little kids running around, even though they're babies because they're there for the first time. Now, I'm not saying that our Father's kingdom could certainly bring children in and families in for certain lessons that he might have in his agenda. I mean, who am I to say that he wouldn't do that? I don't know what is all is on 
uh, his agenda, because that's certainly his mind, not mine. I'm just trying to share with you some of the understanding that has been given to us on these important issues of the last days. What is being saved? What does this period of time mean to me? Now, if you're listening to me, and you can ward off those, I'll tell you what, Lucy and his kingdom have a lot of individuals who can work in the invisible and who can pound on your head and say, don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. I've found the truth for you, and I'll give it to you in the name of what you believe 2,000 years ago. You've brought that 2,000 years ago into today, and you're going to hang on to that history as if it were yours. That's true history. That was real. And it is yours. But when our Father's kingdom sends information sends updates, new opportunities. If you were really connected with our Father's information, if you really knew the truth that was in Jesus, you're going to see it here again. Unfortunately, you're seeing that same mind. What is in a soul is truth or falsehood. The mind of God or the mind of misinformation. That's the reason it boils down to we're either for him or we're against him. Well, goodness, we just got started. We haven't touched but two or three questions, and somebody just held up a card. I saw it. It said 30 <laughs> seconds. So we're going to have to take up more issues at our next session. I'm glad that you have gotten these sessions, that you've watched this, and that you want to learn I hope that the next level can use us as their instruments for you. See you next time.